All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here today with our health commissioner, Dr. Jaraza, uh, and our police commissioner, Michael Harrison. Before we get into our COVID-19 update, I want to first uh, thank Dr. Jaraza and acknowledge the entire team at the city health department for their outstanding work throughout the entire uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, their diligence, expert guidance, and commitment to Baltimore has saved countless lives across the city. Uh, the health department uh, and community health partners helped navigate Baltimore through very difficult times and brought us to where we are today. Because of the leadership of our health department and the efforts of Baltimoreans across the great city, we are seeing significant declines in new cases and hospitalizations. Given the positive trends we are seeing in our data, we will lift our state of emergency and all mandates related to COVID-19 on July 1, 2021, in accordance with the governor's announcement yesterday. Workplaces and businesses do retain the right to set their own policies, and I encourage residents and patrons to respect those policies as they may arise. Further, as masks become optional, I ask everyone to remain courteous to each other, whether you choose to wear a mask or not. I want to be clear about something. Uh, the pandemic is not over. We will continue to follow the science and allow the data to drive our decision making. Folks must continue to get vaccinated so that we can leave COVID behind for good and do not see uh, new strains of COVID or end up the same place where we were as we enter into the fall and winter months as they come up. Uh, if all NBA point guard Chris Paul can still catch COVID-19, so can you. Uh, we all have been through tough times, but as a city, we navigated and fought through together, and I could not be uh, more proud of your resilience, your patience, and most importantly, your cooperation. I'd like to also note that Baltimore's resilience and ingenuity uh, during this pandemic has been recognized globally, as we were just named as a finalist for the Bloomberg uh, Philanthropy's 2021 Global Mayor's Challenge. Uh, thanks to our innovative efforts to support minority businesses disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, Baltimore is now among 50 cities from around the world to advance in global innovation competition to uncover transforma transformative urban solution. It truly takes a village and it takes a team to overcome challenges to build a better Baltimore. And I want to thank the health department and the entire team of Baltimore to include you, most importantly, the residents, uh, the citizens, the business owners in Baltimore. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Jaraza. Good afternoon and thank you, Mayor Scott, for your continued and steady leadership during the pandemic. As Mayor Scott mentioned, we've made incredible progress in our COVID metrics thanks to our vaccination efforts and the efforts of our clinical partners across the city. As of yesterday evening, our daily new case count was approximately 15 new cases per day, a decrease of 84% from four weeks ago. To date, there have been a total of 53,012 confirmed cases in Baltimore City. And our current positivity is 0.7%. This is a 67% decrease from four weeks ago. Our ICU and acute care unit capacity have also decreased and are both holding at 80% and 85% respectively. 1,079 Baltimore City residents have lost their lives to COVID and we are now averaging close to two deaths per day. Also, as of today, nearly 57% of adults 18 and older have been vaccinated with either a first or a single dose of vaccine, while 50% of Baltimore City adults are fully vaccinated. I'll repeat that 50% of Baltimore City adults are fully vaccinated. These are tremendous achievements, and I cannot be more proud of the work of the Baltimore City Health Department and all of our clinical partners who've contributed to these successes. For the past few weeks, Baltimore City has been working to achieve an initial benchmark of 65% of adults, 18 and over, being vaccinated with at least a first or a single dose in order to lift the indoor mask mandate. As many of you are aware, Yesterday, it was announced that the state of Maryland would be moving to lift remaining statewide restrictions and end its state of emergency related to the pandemic by July 1st. This includes lifting of the state's mask order, which still requires face coverings indoors at schools, daycare centers, medical settings, and on mass transit. As Mayor Scott mentioned, 
Baltimore City will lift our local indoor mask mandate on July 1st as well. With this announcement, I'm aware that many will view this as the end of the pandemic. However, I want to be clear, while we have made significant progress as evidenced by our COVID-19 metrics, the public health threat of coronavirus remains high for our unvaccinated population specifically. I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge all of the city residents that have already been vaccinated. On behalf of all of us at the health department, I thank you. You have been the main driver to the decrease in our case counts and fatalities. By getting vaccinated, you're making it harder for coronavirus to spread throughout our communities. And you've paved the way for our transition to what I hope will be sustained improvement in our COVID-19 metrics. It's critical that if you've only received one dose of a two-dose vaccine, that you get your second dose as soon as you are eligible. Whatever your reason for getting vaccinated, whether it was a selfless act, thinking of the health of others, or just acknowledging the benefits of vaccinations that far outweigh the risk of getting COVID or any other personal reason, I want to thank you. Now I'd like to address our unvaccinated population here in Baltimore City. If you're unvaccinated, unless you have a significant medical reason, such as an allergy to a component of the vaccine, please get vaccinated as soon as possible. COVID-19 has claimed the lives of more than 600,000 people in the U.S. alone and more than 4 million people worldwide. I'm aware that there are some hesitations that residents may have about vaccines in general, and I acknowledge that some of these concerns are based in historical truths. However, as opposed to listening to conspiracy theories on TikTok or YouTube or trusting your friends to provide the data on vaccines, please seek out accurate and trusted information about the vaccine from your local healthcare provider or a value vaccine ambassador in your neighborhood. Vaccines are a safe and effective way to protect you from the coronavirus. Almost daily, the health department and our partners are bringing vaccines directly to the communities that need them most. Our value vaccine ambassadors are knocking on doors, providing information, and addressing questions about the vaccines. Vaccine clinics are being scheduled on weekends and in the evenings to ensure more equitable access for individuals who are working or caring for others during the day. The health department will continue to provide access and information about the vaccines for the foreseeable future. And nothing about today's announcement will change our commitment to vaccinating our residents to protect them from a disease that's taken nearly 1,000 or more than 1,000 lives in Baltimore over the last 16 months. The people who are still being hospitalized due to coronavirus and its variants are those who are not vaccinated. Just yesterday, the CDC announced that the new variant of the coronavirus, the Delta variant, has been moved to a variant of concern due to its increased transmissibility increase in severe disease prognosis, and an increase in hospitalization. The White House provided further information, noting that in late May, only 3% of new cases were caused by the Delta variant, but that now makes up 9 to 10% of cases in only a few weeks. The danger of these variants are significantly reduced with a two-dose mRNA vaccination series, with both doses being 88% effective against the Delta variant in studies. Please, if you have not already gotten vaccinated, get vaccinated. Whatever concerns you may have about the vaccine, I encourage you to get the information you need to seriously consider the risk of not being vaccinated. Likewise, I encourage residents to vaccinate their children 12 and older as soon as they can to reduce the chance of severe illness in our pediatric population. Doing so may save your life or the lives of the ones you love the most. While masks will not be required after July 1st, this announcement and update to our orders does not preclude anyone from wearing a mask in public settings or in private. It also does not prevent businesses and other entities from requiring masks of any individuals who enter their establishment. This update removes mask requirements for all when indoors. However, I strongly urge every unvaccinated or partially vaccinated person to continue to mask when unable to socially distance or in large crowds. As more and more of our residents get vaccinated, eventually this personal decision for vaccinated individuals to mask or not mask may be an easier one to make. But we're never going to tell Baltimore City residents not to mask if that is a personal preference. We simply will not require it after July 1st. 
For more information on where you can get vaccinated, please visit baltimorecity.gov slash be more vax. We provide weekly locations and vaccines remain free of charge. No identification is required to receive your free vaccine. If you need help with transportation to or from any vaccination site, even ones not run by the health department, please call 410-372-3444 or email covidtransport at mjminnovations.com. For our city residents who are homebound, the health department continues working with the fire department and a growing number of clinical partners to provide the vaccine to you and your home. If you're homebound, please register for the vaccine at covax.baltimorecity.gov. If you do not have access to the internet, you can also call our Maryland Access Point at 410-396-2273, Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 4.30 p.m., and our staff will help you register. We are still accepting applications from interested community organizations who want to assist in our work canvassing and setting up community vaccination sites with grants up to $5,000. Those interested can visit civicworks.com slash COVAX small groups for more information. Again, if you have not been vaccinated, please get vaccinated as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. D. And I just want to reiterate again that the pandemic is not over. We need folks to still continue to get vaccinated. We want to have less people in our city. We have to honor all of those who we unfortunately lost in our city to this pandemic by doing the right thing. And that's protecting ourselves and the folks that we love. And now we'll take some questions. Ma'am, good afternoon. Hi, Mayor Scott. How are you? I'm good. Good. Um, just an off-topic question. From the town hall last night that you did not attend, some of the residents who were there, including our panelists as well as other people, were frustrated with issues that they feel stretch beyond Fells Point, just a lack of basic city government functions So, as far as picking up the trash and enforcing the laws on the books. Can you explain why the city isn't able to do these basic issues? And if you're going to come, and why not come down and talk to these people in Fells Point? Well, again, I think I have to remind you again for, I think, the 10th time uh, that I was at another community meeting. And, in fact, I did that community meeting live from a, a pop-up emergency operations uh, uh, center that we had yesterday in southwest Baltimore. We have folks who were hit severely by, by uh, the storm from the previous night. I was meeting with the folks from Heritage Crossing who were had asked me previously to meet with them about crime and violence and working with them together to deal with those issues. And we know, listen, uh, I think that you know that dealing with issues, uh, the city has had a legal dumping problem longer than Brandon Scott's been alive. And my, my direction to our city administrator and to our new DPW director is to work every day to solve those issues. But those issues are not going to be solved overnight. We're going to work in partnership with communities. I think you guys came to a press conference in uh, Cold Stream Homestead Montebello where we partner with a community by actually having them help us with trucks and a low packer to deal with illegal dumping in their community. Uh, your, your station chose not to really talk about that. But what we're talking about is building a city government. I think it's important for folks to know. And what I hear from residents where I go throughout the city of Baltimore is that they know our city government has been outdated for far too long. When you talk about DPW in particular, we're talking about an agency that didn't even have GPS software in their trucks until a few months ago. We are building a better city government from the bottom up to make sure that we're more efficient, that we're handling those issues. We're going to be rebuilding the 311 system. Every agency is going to change under our leadership, but that work is underway. It's not going to end today. It's not going to end tomorrow. Thank you. When it comes, you had your question. Next question. I have another question. But we had, we said one. We, that was one question. Okay, go ahead. So the, I know you you were busy for last night, but when or why won't you come down to Fells Point, or will you come I've down been, to Fells Point? I, as I said to your colleague last night, I've been to Fells Point many times. We're going to go and talk to folks across the city where violence is happening. Uh, when you when the question is asked why there why Mon Dalman versus there, we're talking about the loss of life. Uh, we had people, two people in that neighborhood lose their lives. When they talk about why we were in Park Heights versus there, we had a mass murder. We had three people shot in one incident there. That's why we're there. We're talking about life first, violence that takes people's lives first. And I think that people in Baltimore can understand that. And we will work with everyone, including uh, residents and neighbors in Fells Point, to deal with that issue. Ma'am? 
Hi, Mayor Scott. Can you talk about the latest efforts to address the violence in Fells Point, um, the latest efforts from the city? Well, I think you know, and I'll let the police commissioner know, that we had a, a robust deployment, not just in Fells Point, but across the, the city this weekend because the way that we want to operate, and when you're talking about policing, we're not going to pick winners and losers. We're not going to ignore uh, neighborhoods that have had multiple incidents of people dying. We're not going to ignore neighborhoods that have consistently had issues of violence. And what I have tasked the police commissioner with doing is making sure that his agency is where they need it to be. Uh, we know, again, that this incident that happened in Fells Point happened within 15 feet of a police officer. And we have to understand, again, what that what message that sends. They're going to be there. They're going to continue to be there. But they're also going to be in other places. And they're going to also continue to do the great work of removing people who murder people from our streets. It would be wonderful to have us talking about not just about the bad things that are happening, but also how our police department has a 51% clearance rate on homicides, something that families who have lost loved ones would love to hear about. We're going to consistently be working when you think about even gun arrests and the amount of gun arrests that they have, how tremendously they have, have expanded and taken that reach. We're going to continue to focus each and every day in every neighborhood with every agency in the city. And can you provide an update on the two shootings in Fells Point from this last weekend and the previous weekend? I'll let the police commissioner provide the update. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the first incident uh, where the three people were shot, officers, detectives have gone through tens of hours of video evidence, and we've narrowed it to a few individuals where we have identification that we've put out, asking for help identifying them. We're still going through more video because it's just that much video, but we've narrowed it down to one group of individuals who we believe were together, and there are several photographs of individuals who we did not know at the moment we were uh, getting the, the still photographs, but we've put that information out to ask for community's help in identifying them as potential persons of interest. The next incident the following weekend was not a shooting. No one was actually shot. It was a discharging. Uh, we have some information about the vehicle, perhaps that sped away because it happened within feet of officers, but uh, the second incident, which was last weekend, no one was actually shot. So it's not classified as a shooting. D d in, in, sir in relation just before we ask our question just in relation to the this first, is one question go the, ahead well, the mayor was, uh, the commissioner was just talking about the information that was released we haven't seen it on social media can will you be providing that to the media about that group of individuals because yes we will where is it currently we're just um we'll get that to you after this okay for the first question for the mayor tomorrow you've planned the community walk at 5 p.m what can community members in and around mondaman mall expect because some of their are saying it's a waste of time, we don't need a walk, we need clear action. So what can residents expect tomorrow? Well, I think that uh, I've been working with folks in Mondalma for quite some time. And it's not just about the walk is for me to make sure that all of my agencies here is to include the police commissioner see what these individuals see. The action is going to be there. I know that the Western District has a robust deployment in that area. We have to, again, understand that this is a neighborhood that has seen uh, these issues longer than I've been alive and much longer than you and I have been breathing air. And when we're talking about, I think it's important, again, a day for folks to talk about what, you're, what we're building here. This is about building public safety, because I think for all of those who just don't remember, and I'll just give a quick history lesson, uh, zero tolerance didn't work for Baltimore. We have to make sure that the police are focusing in on those groups. Tomorrow is about showing folks, working with those residents, seeing the things that we can do in immediate nature. There will be things that other agencies can do that they can have addressed while we allow police uh, and our partners in public safety to deal and track down the people who are committing the violence there. And the yes, second sir. question, just for Police Commissioner Michael Harrison, um, we're seeing some of these shootings happen in the 11 o'clock hour to about 3 a.m. Can you talk about the deployment plan that the department has, regardless of the neighborhood? Are we seeing more patrols out there? Well, the answer, the answer to that is yes. We, we use data to influence and to inform our deployment. So it's about days of week and times of day where we make adjustments to our patrol and to our discretionary units that we can move around the city. So it's both people focused and it's place focused, but it's also day of week and time of day where we look at times and days when crimes are committed and then we make adjustments daily and weekly uh, 
to satisfy the deployment based on what those trends are, are showing us. Ma'am. Hello, Mayor. I'm Kate Amara from WBAL TV. Two on topic questions. Uh, the first one is your administration stuck to the 65% threshold for so long. What data set or data points allowed you to leave it, let it go now? And what would you say to people, critics who may say you're flip flopping? Well, it's not, it's not about flip flopping. What I've always said, and you know this, is that we're going to be driven by the data. And I've been consistently checking in with our health commission and our other partners, advisors around the data. And we started this conversation really over the weekend about where the data was and how, how we should be able to move. I'll let the health commissioner talk about uh, uh, what specific things we're looking at. But you heard her talk about where our case rate is, right, where our positivity is, where our deaths are, where our hospitalization is. The same things that we've been communicating out for quite some time. And we know that we're now at a point where we think it is safe to do this. This is only about the data. The data has driven, driven me from... Uh, December the 9th when I made the decision to take us into to revert a lot of the things that we released and the data has driven us to this point today where we're saying that on July 1st we're going to release us uh, from these restrictions. No, I think Mayor Scott hit the nail on the head. Um, we're at a point where we are literally averaging 15 new cases per day. Um, this is an extremely low new case rate for the city, one that I don't think that we've ever seen. We have a positivity of 0.7%, 0.7% when we look at testing across the city. Um, so when we were making decisions around restrictions, we often looked at multiple data points. 65% is still a benchmark that we're working towards. Eventually, we want to get towards 80%. But we recognize that today, as of today, 50% of all adults in Baltimore City are fully vaccinated. And that's a big deal. Um, and, and we we want to continue to honor all of those adults that have gotten vaccinated um, and can safely remove their mask when they're in an indoor setting, um, recognizing that, again, businesses still very much have the right to make decisions. People can make personal decisions um, on how comfortable they are with wearing a mask moving forward. Thank you. And um, another on topic question is, does um, uh, abandoning the state of emergency or letting everything go expire on, on July 1st? Does that mean we can expect all city and municipal buildings and uh, the services they provide inside to fully reopen to the public on July 1st as well? No, we, we will be announcing in a separate announcement about how we're going to work through the process. I'm sorry, the mic is going in and out. Uh, how we're going to work through the process of bringing city employees back into the building, making sure that we have a policy and practice that we can have the public come in in a safe space. Uh, and this is the work that the city administrator and our HR director are underway. And you can expect an announcement on that soon. But I will say that I think that it's in particularly, and I think you all know this as the media because you've been into the buildings many times. We have to also note that the, um, that many of our buildings are old and they are not built for a way that provides uh, an ample place for people to physically distance. And we're going to have to make sure that we're working to protect folks because we know it's not, it's not just about protecting our employees, but protecting folks who are coming in to do things because we don't want to put our citizens at any risk. But we will be announcing it. Thank so, you. And I'm sorry, but you mentioned distancing. So does that mean the distancing mandates and regulations are not going away July 1st? I'm sorry. To, I had no, to it's, yeah. the mandates are going away. But okay. this, is, this is about best practices, especially not knowing what folks are vaccinated or not. Emily? Thank you. Um, regarding city buildings not opening, how do you, you've mentioned that city hall is no building. So is the state house. So are some of the courthouses. How do you view it as different and why should it be held to a different standard? Well, I think it's, it's not a better standard. It's about us doing our due diligence. I can't speak to uh, what the other folks are doing. And you have to think, for example, uh, when the courthouse is open, but the jurors are actually coming to the War Memorial Building because we know uh, the state that the courthouse is in long before COVID-19. Uh, we, we're talking about putting in best practices and standards for what we want to do to make sure that we're doing the right thing. We won't compare ourselves to other folks. And regarding lifting the masking mandate, um, I'm sure you've consulted with your lawyers. Is it your understanding that you have the legal standing to continue um, restrictions if you wanted to? It, yes. We don't think that we understanding that we've been able to continue without based on our local emergency mandate but the reality is we're not continuing with it and we're just advising folks who are visiting private facilities if uh if those places still want folks to to people wear masks we want folks to respect that and it's your personal choice some people might want to wear them for fashion yes sir 
As I'm sure you might want to do sometimes, right, Mayor? <laughs> Fashion statements. So, so if you're going to an O's game, yay or nay on the mask outside now that this is going to be lifted on July 1st? On July 1st, you won't have to wear a mask. Okay. My second question is for Dr. Giraza about the uh, folks who are not vaccinated yet. Uh, what does the racial makeup look like that? I know we've done a lot of stories about uh, people who are getting vaccinated, the hesitancy. And are you frustrated that you just can't seem to get uh, further in that line that you really wanted to? So we certainly have more specific number breakdown on our, our website, um, but I think right now we're at about 34%, if I'm remembering off the top of my head, of African Americans um, having received at least a first or a single dose, um, and I think 55% um, of Caucasians having received a first and a single dose. Um, of note, when we look at the Latinx population versus non-Latinx, um, they actually are have greater um, vaccination coverage. Um, so about 46%, I think, of that population compared to 43% um, of the general population. That This is all ages that I'm speaking about, so let me also say that. Um, so, you know, I think in, in terms of being frustrated, um, we continue to push towards the mark. Nothing has changed as far as our, our outreach and our education efforts. Nothing has changed as far as providing um, vaccination clinics um, to our neighborhoods that we know are highest need with lowest vaccination coverage. We are still looking at that. Um, we still have value vaccine ambassadors focused on those harder to reach populations. Um, and now is when we continue to do the work of that education and that engagement so that people can make an informed decision. Right. Thank you both. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>